to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Where are we? Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're going to check in today with Representative Nicole Bowen of the State House of Representatives, and uh, she is the chair of the Energy and Environment Committee, which is very important, and she's in an important spot. No stress, Nicole. Uh, and 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 <laughs> I'll just tell you that she's uh, she's from Kailua, the District Seven which is all along the Kailua coast there. Um, and she covers a lot of ground. There's a lot of ground out there, including energy facilities. And um, um, she's on the committee for energy and also for agriculture. And she has been on finance, grants and aid, judiciary, Hawaiian affairs, water and land. And she's a really long, long running representative in the house. She's been there for several terms and that's important. This is her third year as appointee to the U.S. Department of Energy's Electricity Advisory Committee. She's serving as the co-chair of the Council on State Government Western Region Committee on Energy and Envi I guess that's enough, right? That's enough, Nicole. If I go through the whole thing, we'll be here all day. Um, thank you very much for coming on. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So let me uh, let me just go through some of the questions that have come up. Uh, I guess the first one, everybody's interested in bills that have been introduced in the ledge about energy, either by your committee or otherwise, uh, in this session. Can you identify uh, the ones that we should care about? Um, I mean, I think the big focus this year is on the, the response to the Maui fires, and there's several bills relating to the... Um, uh, response to the part the utility played in that or the effect that it had on the electric utility that I think are, um, you know, definitely of interest that we should talk about. Um, <clears throat> and then like past years, we've got bills relating to um, a variety of things, some topics that we see over and over, like um, the wheeling conversation. We have a number of bills relating to um, kind of trying to incentivize more hydrogen use. We've got, of course, the um, you know energy efficiency bills and looking at expanding electric vehicle infrastructure, just to name a few. Yeah, right. Oh, well, that sounds like that's a pretty, that's a broad swath of bills. There's a lot of issues in there, what you just described. Let's talk about Maui for a minute, you know. Uh, we really haven't gotten over the tragedy and uh, part, of, part of that um, is the, the blame game. Part of that is to try to learn from it so it doesn't repeat itself because climate change will repeat these these problems uh, either by way of fire or extreme weather or both. Um, so can you talk about the bills dealing with Maui and how we're going to come out of the, the whole experience being better? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of open questions there. Um, from what I've seen, at least through my committee, there's three main... main um, pushes. The first one is just to uh, uh, establish a statutory requirement for wildfire mitigation plans. So presumably this is something the utility would already be doing, but this just puts a backstop in law that ensures they have to and kind of lays out some um, bullets of what have to be covered and a process that involves the Public Utilities Commission as well as stakeholder input, which is really important. And this um, bill would, you know, mimic pretty similarly things that have been done in California and Oregon and other wildfire prone states. So that's one thing. Um, the kind of push and pull on that as we move through session is, you know, how will, how will it be paid for, right? Will, will it be rate based? Will there be other measures put in place to help pay for that? Um, and also the question of liability. Some of the amendments, for example, that, um, Hawaiian Electric wants for that bill would be to um, say that once the wildfire plans are approved by the Public Utilities Commission, then the liability is taken off the utility and it all goes, you know, onto the PUC. So uh, those are an example of, you know, amendments I don't entirely agree with that we're going to keep having conversation about. Um, the other, another, you know, there's been the two other ones. One is to establish a kind of like a wildfire fund, and this is less directly related to my committee. I just um, have seen this bill because I sit on other committees it's gone to. And this mimics what the um, governor's kind of already set up ad hoc, but it's a big fund that the utility and state and some private players might pay into. And this would be um, something that victims of the fire could um you know, get a settlement out of to try to head off some of the litigation and reduce the costs and expedite the process. So this would be for like property loss and things like that. And then the third one, and probably the most um, uh, impactful and one that everyone should be paying attention to, attention to is a bill that would authorize 
um, a process of securitization for the electric utility. So because right now their credit rating is so bad, they don't really have the ability to borrow money, which you know they need for ongoing improvements and also for implementing additional wildfire mitigation that people are going to be looking for in the wake of the fires. And so securitization, to kind of boil it down to the simplest terms, which took me a while to figure out because it was being explained to me in ways that made it sound much more complicated than it really is. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it would basically just be um, putting a fee on every ratepayer's bill that would be collateral for whatever bond they take out to, to borrow this money. And so this would impact um, people's bills depending on the size of the bond. Um, and that one, I think, is something we should all be watching closely. Yeah, okay. And we, you know, in many ways, I think we're kind of tied up in dealing with the fire, but um, there's a lot of projects we need to do to get to, get to our goals. Uh, and that, that that drum has to keep on beating. Um, and uh, I guess some of them, or maybe all of them, require legislation to facilitate the possibility and therefore, you know, the prospect of getting to our goals. Is there anything, are there any big projects that are happening now? Uh, and um, is, is it necessary? Do we have legislation that would facilitate them? I mean, the process, you mean like renewable energy projects or energy? Yes, projects? yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that primarily that is handled through the RFP process in the commission. And I know that they've just come out of, you know, announcing RFP3. And and I think, you know, the push has to continue to come either, you know, either and through legislation and through the executive branch to just try to keep these projects on track. I mean, what we've seen in the past is a lot of proposals for, for new projects, but very few of them that are actually online delivering energy to the grid right now. And, um, you know, we need to be able to rely on knowing those will actually be executed so that planning processes can take place, et cetera. So I think there's questions of just that oversight um, of trying to facilitate interconnection, of, of having, you know, one debate that's come up at the legislature repeatedly and again this session is whether um, the Public Utilities Commission should be um, exercising the authority they have to establish a Hawaii Electricity Reliability Administrator, the, the HERA Administrator. Um, so that might be something that changes. It sounds like now the, P, the, new, the current PUC is interested in actually moving ahead and doing that. So we'll see that and maybe that will help with some of these reliability questions and keeping, um, you know, hopefully also keeping these new projects on track and having someone kind of keep an eye on the big picture and make sure that things are moving forward. Yeah, one thing I caught in the paper um, was uh, that we had, um, I guess it was a um, uh, rolling blackout, Big Island, because of, uh, uh, you know, domino kind of equipment failures, and uh, 8,000 people uh, didn't have power for a while. And of course, that's that's bad for them, it's bad for the utility, it's, it's bad for, it's a black eye for the state, actually, and and people, you know, fold it into their decision about whether to stay here or leave uh, when they when they go blackout because you know you really can't do anything when you have a blackout. All your you know your activities at home and in the office are stopped. And so, clearly, what what can we do? What are we doing in order to prevent that? In order to prevent that, not only the Big Island where you know you have you have this uh, domino problem, but maybe elsewhere in the state, uh, maybe Oahu. How can we avoid these blackouts? Yeah. I mean, the Big Island ones, it's two separate cases. Uh, the Big Island blackouts, I mean, there have been repeated outages at Hamakua Energy Partners, um, you know, over the past year, even before that. And so I've, you know, I've personally called the PUC and said, hey, is anyone looking into this? I, I mean, I'm assured that they are, but of course, we don't get to hear results of, of that. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it's, it's, I think that Kiko, Helco, all of these have a lot of aging infrastructure, and the bulk of the power supply is still coming from, um, you know, from these fossil fuel power generators that are many of which are quite dated, and there's a lot of work that needs to be put into bringing them up to date and, you know, transitioning some of them off the grid, bringing more renewables online, et cetera. But um, yeah, I do think there could be more oversight on that reliability piece. Um, especially when you start seeing things happening repeatedly, like on the Big Island with the repeated calls for conservation. Mm, yeah, conservation meaning when the utility tells you not to not to use power. Yes, that's, like, that's always kind of third world when they yeah. do that. 
And then the situation on Oahu, which was, uh, I guess, a couple months ago here when we, when there were, um, you know, several days of, of rain and, you know, that, that outage was really due to, as I understand, an outage at the Y out power plant. And additionally, I think there was another uh, generator offline at Campbell for repairs. And then because it had been cloudy, everyone was blaming, oh, not enough renewable energy. And um, the fact that the battery, the new um, standalone battery storage facility, KES, uh, not having been charged. But realistically, to me, that was more a failure of HECO's planning because the cloudy weather is somewhat predictable situation. And, you know, you got to plan for a worst case scenario, not kind of hope for the best when you're an electric utility. And I think that they could have, um, you know, put the other generator back online and charge the KES batteries um, from the grid, even if that was charging with fossil fuel, not renewables, that would have at least kept the lights on. Um, so seeing things like that happen and kind of understanding what's really going on and then hearing it get spun in the media to blame renewable energy, which is really a still a relatively small part of Oahu's grid, um, that, that can be frustrating. Well, you know, every day, Nicole, I get up and I look out the window and I say, what a beautiful day, one day closer to the next storm. That's what I say to myself. <laughs> and we are all one day closer to the next storm and it will come, it is coming. And when it comes, it'll be extreme given, you know, the, ext the extreme quality of climate change increasingly. And so, you know, the question is, are we ready? Is there an issue? Is it being discussed? Are we ready for extreme weather or will we just go down? Yeah, I mean, I assume, I would hope that yes, it is being discussed, um, but there's definitely a lot of infrastructure upgrades, et cetera, that need to happen, that take time and money, that, that we can be talked about, that we know that they're needed, but it doesn't mean they're being implemented. So I think that Hawaii, you know, in the event of a really big, um, event is still somewhat vulnerable. I mean, you're never going to be 100% foolproof, right? But I think that, um, you know, looking more at microgrids, looking at, um, you know, being able to island parts of the grid so everything doesn't go down at once and things like that can really go a long way. And then, you know, hardening some of the infrastructure, which also um, helps, um, uh, you know, in the event of something like a wildfire, but, you know, strengthening those kinds of infrastructure, like poles that are above ground, et cetera, can help. And then undergrounding where it's possible and not too costly, things like that make sense. But are they all, is it all done? No. I mean, it's it's talked about, it's understood, but it's costly to implement and, and takes a lot of time. Oh, that's a moving target. I remember we had somebody from, um, I guess it was uh, somebody from an organization in Washington that looks into energy sustainability on after Maria in Puerto Rico. And uh, it was a very interesting discussion because there were two kinds of, of fasteners used for the solar. And they had large solar farms in Puerto Rico. And uh, there, there was a farm um, where they held, the fasteners held. And right across the, the way was another farm uh, where the fasteners didn't hold. And it was ripped up by the hurricane. And so it's a regulatory issue, of course, um, but it seems to me that you can make choices on this and be better off in the case of extreme weather, as, as Puerto Rico, unfortunately, had too many fasteners that weren't fastened. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's one thing. But the other thing is that you mentioned earlier is that the media was spinning, it, uh, spinning the blackout around renewable energy. But in fact, we have talked for 20 years about, about a portfolio that's diversified. And we have talked about, you know, not only solar. Solar has emerged, but we talked about wind. We've talked about offshore wind. Talked about geothermal, which has sort of got a ceiling over it. Um, talked about hydrogen. We talked about an inter-island cable. We talked about algae for a while, biofuel, and there was an article in the paper about this partnership between the Army and Hawaiian Electric, um, where the where the Army would provide power. Uh, to Hawaiian Electric, if necessary, but it was biofuel. And I'm, it's interesting that we have enough biofuel to do that. Talked about ocean energy. And I remember a big red ship uh, in Kona uh, off uh, Kauai High where, with the letters OTEC painted on the red hull of this big ship. It was, uh, I think, experimental, but uh, it was a real possibility at the time. I could go on. There are other things that might be in the portfolio. But, Nicole, it strikes me that over the past few years, we have migrated to 
you know, the emerging dominant player of solar. Um, should there be more diversified uh, resources, diversified renewables in the portfolio? Uh, what can we do? What are we doing? What's the discussion on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's right. And yeah, we, sh we should want a more diversified portfolio, but it really comes down to cost. I mean, the reason that we see the growth of utility scale solar projects is because um, it's the best bang for the buck for ratepayers. And I mean, there's a tremendous pressure um, on Hawaiian Electric justifiably to keep rates down because we have the highest um, you know, electricity rates in the nation in Hawaii and the cost of living is already incredibly high here and it's challenging. So, you know, all these other options, a lot of them, ones that you mentioned are um, uh, like not really at commercial scale. Some are just years long projects like, you know, doing offshore wind, for example, I think it's under discussion, but it's not something that we would see online for, you know, another decade or so, um, potentially. Things like geothermal, like we, you know, obviously have geothermal on the big island. Um, you know, I introduced a bill this year that, you know, given the budget situation probably won't get funded, but I think there's a lot more to be done to look at geothermal exploration. And that is a possibility because that's been a relatively affordable um, option. But, you know, a lot, it just, a lot of it just comes down to cost. And I think that, um, um, you know, there's kind of that, almost like a trope of people just like to say, well, the sun's not always going to be shining. So therefore, you know, renewable energy is not reliable, but it's still a, it's still a, you know, minority percent of any grid. And it's, um, it's the, the production profile of a renewable energy project is understood and then planned around. So we are not, you know, obviously building it and planning or expecting it to be, um, the sun to be shining all night long. So, you know, the idea that we're not, that it's not being planned around and still cost effective on that basis is, is understood. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, when, when the utilities have to move forward to get off of some of the, you know, baseload generation that's coming from, um, you know, still imported oil, et cetera, some of which used to be coming from coal, that some of that will get replaced by biodiesel, um, likely, you know, uh, and we'll have to keep looking at all these other types of energy and hoping that some of them pan out to be cost effective. But I think a lot of people get pie in the sky ideas about what they'd like to see and just tend to ignore the realities of, of how expensive some of these things cost. I mean, we don't have ratepayers that are going to want to pay for the amount it would cost to, you know, deliver them electricity from OTEC at this point in time, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's expensive. On the other hand, it's expensive the way it is now. Um, you know, the high rate must be close to 50 cents. Um, so what about KIUC? We haven't talked about KIUC. Is, is, it, is it's, 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 it's in this discussion, isn't it? Um, uh, it, it is affected by mm, some of the bills. Um, it, is, it operates differently. Uh, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, well, this kind of brings my mind back to talking about the wildfires, actually. Um, I think KIUC as a co-op, not that they, they haven't had their own struggles, but they really just provide a good example of how that model of ownership has really allowed them to keep rates stable, bring rates down, um, and provide, you know, more renewable energy more quickly. And, um, yeah, when you look at the situation that's going on with Hawaiian Electric and, you know, their, their financial situation, you know, right now they're with the securitization that we discussed earlier. I mean, they're essentially asking for the state to come in and and bail them out and allow them to borrow a large amount um, on you know on the backs of what would be a significant increase of every ratepayer's bill. And, you know, depending how much I think we had. Well, I won't go too in the weeds. Sorry, let me <laughs> reel it back. But but I think at the same time, when you look at Hawaiian Electric, they haven't revealed any information to us at least about what they've been doing internally if they've sold any of their assets. Um, if they're looking at selling, you know, American Savings Bank, if they're looking at, um, you know, their, their very high salaries and very top heavy administration um, or any of that stuff before they come to ratepayers asking us. And so I think when you look at something like KIUC and how that's worked out and, and pair that with thinking about how there's been kind of a long time interest in talking about possible cooperative ownership models on Hawaii Island and Maui, it's probably more feasible for neighbor islands because as rural areas, they can qualify for funding in different ways than Oahu could. 
Um, and so this could be, you know, a potential opportunity. It's that's never happened in the past because Hawaiian Electric doesn't want to sell, and without a willing seller, it's really not not on the table. Um, so this, it's a little. I'm a little far field of maybe what you wanted to ask me about KIUC, but it just reminded me that I didn't bring that up earlier. And I think it's something that we should all be talking about in the state, really, as a this is a window of opportunity. And it's an opportunity to just try to understand what would be in the best interest of ratepayers. I mean, not even to say that there should be a specific outcome or there should be a co-op or shouldn't, but we should play out the scenario, understand it, and and try to figure out what makes the most sense for the public benefit. You know, before we just jump in and agree to basically bail out Hawaiian Electric. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a couple of other loose end issues that have come and gone. Um, you know, uh, there are still people around who believe that NextEra should have been permitted to uh, merge or buy Hawaiian Electric. How does that look retrospectively? Oh, I mean, that's such a counterfactual. Like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what they would have done differently or not, or, you know, what that, that, or what people's reasons for thinking that are specifically. So, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. What about, uh, what about LNG? LNG, I remember David Ige got up at an energy conference and he said, um, without really conferring with the, the, you know, the energy community, he said, I, I don't want you to you know, do this merger and I also don't want you to bring in LNG. On the other hand, LNG is recognized on the mainland as a bridge fuel. It is happening globally as a bridge fuel. There are a lot of countries that are actively using it with, with apparently um, reasonable plans to bridge. Um, to renewables with LNG. Is there a possibility of that here? I mean, in my view, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't see it happening, I guess. I mean, I, I'm not the decider of that. I wouldn't say any, not anything's in the realm of possibility, I suppose. But, but um, I just think that the, the infrastructure that would have to be built and the retrofits on the existing um, plants, if, or even if they would have to be build new ones, would be like it would be an incredibly high cost. I think for some of the places on the mainland using it as a bridge fuel, they already have the infrastructure. Mm. To bring it here would be like a whole new thing. So it's not as simple as it sounds. So I mean, just on a on a cost, if you weren't even worried about, okay, do we want to? And if you pick something as a bridge fuel to move from oil to gas and then to renewable, when you actually have the option of building out renewables. I mean, if you're going to commit to building all that infrastructure, you're locked in for, you know, a minimum of 30 years, probably longer, just otherwise it would just be, you know, throwing, throwing money away to even invest in it in the first place. So mm -hmm. I just don't know that, I don't know that it would make sense. And my guess is that's probably part of the reason, you know, why that, that didn't, you know, didn't get approved. And it was part of the conversation. Cause I think there's all the things people say publicly, about oh, not wanting its mainland company or not wanting LNG because of fossil fuel and so on and so forth. But behind the scenes, you also have people doing the analysis at the PUC and, you know, uh, you know, other entities and just looking at what does it really cost and what's the real reality of how feasible it even is. And I think there would be some questions there. Yeah, we have to be practical. That's for sure. And if you have a big expense like uh, LNG, LNG, you know, facilities, uh, you have to amortize that. You, you don't get the money back. Uh, okay, and, and there are two bills pending in this uh, session about nuclear energy. Nicole, can, can, you, can you talk about nuclear energy for a moment here in Hawaii, Nay? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, we didn't, at least on the House side, I haven't followed what's moving in the Senate, but on the House side, we're not hearing either of those bills. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple things. One, Hawaii has a... a um, in, in the Hawaii state constitution, it says that uh, any nuclear project has to be approved by two thirds. So a first thing to do to move forward on anything nuclear would be to undo that. Um, that probably does not the kind of thing that sort of on a principle level makes sense to have in the constitution. And I think we should always be open to, you know, any potential technology, but I mean, kind of similar to what we just talked about, I think um, nuclear is incredibly expensive to build. So it wouldn't be an affordable option for Hawaii to build a new plant. I think most of the federal investments in nuclear right now are, have to do with keeping existing nuclear facilities running for as long as possible because they are um, low emissions and, um, and are an important part of like the decarbonization efforts. And Hawaii also being like a seismic volcanic um, 
state, it might not be the greatest choice for here either. But that said, I think, you know, like we were, we spoke earlier about modular nuclear, like a kind of small, smaller scale. And I think there could be certain use cases that it could make sense. And I think it just would have to really be considered case by case. But again, I just look at it as one of these things where people's idea of it gets ahead of them looking into the reality of, of what are the financials for it. Um, cause like everything that I understand about nuclear and nuclear power plant is it's incredibly expensive. So we're trying to find ways to bring rates down for everyone here in Hawaii, not, not up. Yeah. Uh, who knew it been very controversial. It's still controversial cause they went sued Hawaiian electric, um, for some kind of contract claim. Um, they, and they're, they, as I said before the show, they, they keep on going and going and going, even though the court, the courts have ruled against them. Uh, so query, where are they and what does it mean? And what does it mean for, uh, you know, for that kind of fuel, that kind of plant? Um, I honestly, since the last PUC decision, I have not, um, or was it court decision? No, it was PUC. Um, I haven't followed super closely what what Huhonua is up to. I think as far as being a power producing facility, it's in my opinion not going to happen, um, despite like rumors that keep circulating and so on. And you know why the the owners of the company keep pushing? I'm not sure. You know, there's all kinds of sort of conspiracy theories out there. I don't know the reasoning. It's sort of um, hard to fathom <laughs> for some of us what's going on. And and to the other point of the question, I mean biomass. Biomass can, I think, take a lot of different forms. So I, I would say, like, you know, like any, like any kind of power, you would never say never. You'd want to look at it case by case. But I think that that in this particular case, judging by the, you know, greenhouse gas analysis, it just didn't make sense because it wasn't really reducing emissions. And their their only way of balancing the checkbook on it and making it look like it reduced emissions was to talk about all these mitigation efforts they were going to do to plant trees in the future. That was would have been really hard to. Um, enforce or follow up on or even know if it was going to happen. So I think that particular project, I, I don't picture it coming back. Yeah, yeah, truly. Um, so uh, one last thing which uh, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about, and that is um, electric vehicles, uh, all the rage, not only, uh, you know, here to certain, a certain extent, maybe uh, an extent that should be greater, uh, but on the mainland and in, everywhere in the world, China is building an enormous number of electric vehicles right now. Uh, it has the market on that. But, but query, how are we doing and what can we do more? I recall a few years ago that we had not only a federal incentive tax credit, uh, we had a state tax credit. Now we don't have a state tax credit. But what do you see in the future on that? Is there anything pending on it? Um, I think right now the focus has been on continuing to try to build out public infrastructure. I mean, sales of electric vehicles increased, I think, in Hawaii 30 percent in the last year. And just sort of anecdotally, like everyone you talk to says, oh, my next car will be electric. Um, and so there's a big need to continue to build out public infrastructure. And um, uh, I think right now, because people who charge at home tend to be homeowners who might have solar on their rooftop, who own a single family residence or something like that. And the idea of getting more public charging out there so people can charge while they're at work, while they're shopping, um, you know, maybe while they're, you know, gets parked in different places out and about, that will open up the option to um, let more people sort of share in the savings that you can realize by owning an electric vehicle. And I think as you said, we're seeing more and more models come out that are more affordable. The whole question of range anxiety is pretty much settled at this point. Like you can go just as far in a charged battery as a gas tank. It's just figuring out where you're going to charge it and the fact that charging does take longer than just filling out a gas filling up a gas tank. Um, and then like one measure that we're considering as an example at the legislature this year would be to um require all new construction of state facilities to be EV charger ready in their parking. And then to also do some retrofitting of parking at state facilities. Um, and the idea is if we can get people to charge while they're parked at work, it, it brings that use to the middle of the day where it's better for the grid when there's more renewable energy on the grid, where there's more overproduction um, and kind of balances that out. So it's a win-win. And then the convenience of just being able to charge while you're parked at work. Um, but I always say whenever we start talking about the clean energy transition, the part that gets left out and the part that's always the most important and should be the you know, always the overarching goal should be to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Like we have a lot of 
traffic problems and land use problems and lifestyle problems that come about from just getting in our cars, you know, every time we want to go somewhere and not relying enough on public transit, not properly funding public transit and not building walkable communities. And those should be the first things that we focus on um, always, but we just don't do it enough. Yeah. Well, that, that, that last point, that's really valuable because if we had public uh, transit, we would be, um, you know, in the larger picture, we'd be saving money, we'd be saving the environment. Um, we wouldn't be stressing out our resources and, and doing greenhouse gases because uh, most people still have, you know, gasoline cars. That's, it's not, that's not a good thing. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, so public transit. More efficient, I, more efficient than an EV too. For it's sure. not directly on any of your committees, but what about rail? Uh, your feelings? Um, oh, I mean, I support I support it in concept. I think um, right now, I mean, we got a chance to go ride the part that's open. And right now it's, it's just not, it doesn't go into town. So it's not like useful to a large amount of the population of Oahu. But <clears throat> like in concept, yes, we need, we need transit like that. We need rail, we need buses, et cetera. I mean, like I grew up in Europe. You know, until I was 15 years old. So the it's such a different, it's just such a different whole world, <laughs> I guess, in the way that public transit is accessible and it goes everywhere. And even if you're in a more rural area, there's a train or a bus. And and in America, it's just like all cars all the time to the point where people here are so used to it. I think they have a hard time envisioning anything, anything different. But uh, like really having better public transit would make so much sense for an island in particular. Um, and it's just, it's a healthier lifestyle overall. So, I mean, just things that will I know will never happen here. It's like, it's great that we're getting rail on Oahu. They should be talking about rail for, you know, Big Island or Maui, like build it now before you're trying to puzzle piece it in between everything that's already built, you know, make, uh, you know, things like that. But that's, you know, it would be a county project. It's not really a, a state no, thing. It's not, it's not a state. Really happen. There's probably not public support for it. This is just my thoughts <laughs> but but yeah and my thoughts as i remember uh, a couple of uh, administrations ago on the big island they had these buses for people who lived in hilo and worked in hotels in kona and the buses were free the buses were free i say that the buses were free and um, i i tell you if you want to encourage people to take public transportation make it cheap really cheap yeah. or free and well, then buses everybody will do right. it i think buses are free right now Due to like a federal grant, but it's still not convenient enough on Big Island. Maybe a little bit more so in Hilo, but in Kona, they just don't come often enough. So it, it's true, though. I mean, it's like, you know, roads aren't free. We pay for them in taxes, but we're not shelling out a dollar or swiping a card every time we use them. So so people think don't think about what they pay to drive on roads. And it should really be the same for public transit. I mean, it should be open and, and covered by taxpayers and available to all. And we shouldn't have to feel like it's a nickel and dime thing every time you use it. That definitely discourages people too. Okay, last question, if you don't mind, Nicole. So chair of the energy committee, you know, in my dreams, I'd like to be chair of the energy committee, but I'm, like, I'm not going to run for office, I'm telling you now. Um, but, you know, you have a, a, an interesting possibility, interesting place in the state, in the future of the state, because as energy goes, so goes the economy of the state. Everybody knows. So, as the chair, looking down the road, um, between now, we're having a show, by the way, called Down the Road with Electric Vehicles. <laughs> looking, looking down the road as the chair of the Energy Committee, not environmental, connected. Um, what, what do you see as the deliverables, you know, that you would like to see adopted into law this session? And if not this session, next session. You know, what's, what, what do you wrap your arms, what do you embrace as what you could provide to the state in terms of those deliverables? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I think that a lot of a lot of what we've talked about, some of the specific like project implementation stuff falls to, um, you know, either private entities or the PUC or energy office to have oversight. But I think that we can ensure that we're setting up good, clear, transparent, and, you know, functional processes to move that forward. Um, and then, you know, I think that what, at least what I've worked on a fair amount since the time I've been there, it's really a lot of focus on energy efficiency, which of course is like the the kind of the, 
the thing that people get least excited about, but also that's the most important, right? That we can really do a lot more digging deep in energy efficiency and just reducing demand in, in a lot of little ways that people just don't think about and probably won't notice actually once they're implemented, but that's really important. And then, yeah, I think we've worked a fair amount on the um, clean transportation transition. You know, a lot of that focus, like I said, has been on transitioning to electric vehicles um, mainly because we don't have the same kind of jurisdiction over the public transit piece. And um, the EVs are right now the kind of the ready the ready um, solution on the market. So I focused on those things. But I think more broadly speaking, I mean, the state has those big goals of um, you know, 100% renewable energy, of being fully decarbonized, and just as far insofar as we can support that on a policy level, that's what we try to do. And then the committee, of course, has other things besides energy. Um, that we're working on. So there's those things as well. Now that's another show. I do want to have another show with you about all the other things you're working on. You know, what strikes me, Nicole, is that when, when clean energy first came up, which has to be 20 years ago by my measure of it, um, and Sharon Moriwaki was just uh, starting the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and all that, um, it was simple. We have to have clean energy and, and uh, in whatever form. And there are people who resisted it. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the, um, uh, the battle went to clean energy. And we are now that's a settled issue. The only question is degree. And what I, what I get out of this discussion with you is that <clears throat> it was a simple issue 20 years ago. It is no longer simple. Uh, there are so many sub-issues and collateral issues and other issues involving so you know your desk your plate must be completely full of all these issues you know it's like every day something else am i right yeah i mean yes and no i mean i think the legislature has you know we kind of have our role to play and we're not always as involved in in the day-to-day -day, um or privy to all the information necessarily either so i would say that but but yeah, I mean, I think that, that just going back to what you said about clean energy, it seems simple and maybe it's not simple. I mean, I think the thing that is simple right now moving forward is that one, we know it's cheaper and it's that's proven out, right? It's, and, you know, just with the volatility of oil prices um, and all the uncertainty associated with that, I think, you know, we know that it's not a, it's not a choice. People like, like, I think used to cast it more as a choice between being renewable and good for the environment and being affordable. And I think those actually those two things come together, which really helps us move forward. And the second thing I would say is that I think, you know, if people ask, can we make it to 100%? Can we do 100%? And I would say absolutely yes, but that that there's too much, I think people get overly focused on whether, whether 100% or not 100% or how. I mean, I think the more important thing is that we can quite easily make it to, you know, 80 or 90, um, you know, keeping prices low, moving forward, largely decarbonizing, being more self-reliant, all of these things. And that the the last, you know, 10% or, you know, 5% or 15% that's more tricky, that's going to be something we have to think about now, something we've got to plan for, something that'll have to be tackled. But like, it shouldn't detract from the efforts that we have now to move forward as quickly as possible with adopting more clean energy, because I think it really is a multiple, multiple benefits. Representative Nicole Lawen, Chair of the Energy and Environment Committee in the House of Representatives State of Hawaii, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Aloha.